Thank you very much, John. You're listening to Saturday Live, doing for Radio 4 what jeggings could do for you. No, I've got no idea either. <laughs> now that the election is over, we can concentrate on the real business of the summer, the World Cup. Prepare yourselves. It's only 27 days to go until the tournament starts in South Africa. And for those lucky enough to be going, BA strikes permitting, the adrenaline must be pumping already. So imagine if in 1966 you were working in London with not that much cash to throw around and a burning desire to see the World Cup being held here. And what happened? to fall into your lap but tickets to every England game and three whole tickets to the final. It sounds Willy Wonka-esque, doesn't it? But it really happened to Neil Coppendale who came into our Brighton stand a couple of weeks ago to tell us about his very lucky break. I was in my first job trainee hotel management and working as a receptionist in a hotel just off Oxford Street in London uh, working a late shift when into reception to check in came a a bespectacled oriental gentleman, Japanese, I think, came up to the uh, desk and put some pieces of paper down, which I didn't really take any notice of, and, and started to talk to me in Japanese, which I didn't talk, and then proceeded to check in. It was fairly obvious during this part of the conversation that he was leaving these pieces of paper on purpose, not that uh, when he went away he'd forgotten them, but go away he did, went to his room and left them on the desk. I hadn't taken any notice of them until then, but when I inspected them, lo and behold, there were series tickets for the whole of the 66 World Cup tournament. That's the England group games at Wembley and all the games in the later stages, including three tickets for the final. Imagine my absolute wonder. So when you looked at them, you opened that envelope and you saw them all in there, was your immediate thought, hmm... Maybe I could use them. <laughs> well, yes, I, it certainly must have been. But I thought, well, I'll hang on to them. I presume he'll come back for them or somebody else will come collect them at that stage. This was a week, 10 days, I suppose, before the opening of the tournament on the 11th of July. And I thought I'll hang on to them and, and see what happens. So what did happen? I mean, he never came back, did he? He had checked out of the hotel. Absolutely not. Come the day of the first match against Uruguay, which ended in, a, in a, an inglorious nil-nil draw, I thought, well, here are the tickets, nobody's come to claim them, I shall go, and go I did. Do you think that you'd kind of talked yourself into thinking it was OK to take the tickets? Because it was such an enormous thing, you know, you were never going to get to go to these matches if you hadn't had that lucky break? I mean, you were taking somebody else's stuff. No? Absolutely not. No, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And, and I think it was because it was a gradual process to an extent and that really, come the day of the first match, I mean, what was I supposed to do? Just leave the tickets lying there and waste them as nobody had come to collect them or use them. So... I chose the latter. Was there really no way of tracking this bloke down? I mean, if he'd checked into the hotel, didn't he give an address for that? Well, I suppose he must have done. Um, uh, but no, not really. Uh, it didn't occur to me at the time. Rightly or wrongly, I didn't try to track him down. But I say again, you know, the most important part of this part of the proceeding is that he definitely left those tickets there purposely. And he did tell me something, although I couldn't understand it. Maybe he said... Here you are, young man, it's your lucky day. Well, yeah, for the purposes of the interview, <laughs> let's pretend that he did, Neil, and just crack on. Yes, if you will. Uh, so, yeah. so you used these tickets, but at the beginning, when you started going mm. to those games, you must have been a little bit worried that you would turn up <laughs> and be standing next to a group of Japanese businessmen, <laughs> you know, with them all saying, where's our friend? Who's Absolutely. that bloke standing there? Absolutely, yes, um, but it didn't happen. I, I, I suppose I've always been a bit of a risk taker, and that was taking a risk, but no, there was no problem whatsoever. However, I didn't see any oriental gentlemen or ladies. No, no problem at all. I know that, you know, whenever there is a World Cup on or European Championships or whatever, you know, even the final of the FA Cup, there's an atmosphere that pervades the country, isn't there? And for most of us, that is just by watching the games on television. If you're actually going to the games, can you explain how that does transform your life during those weeks? Oh, it's exhilarating, isn't it? Orgasmic even, Fee. Very, very exciting. Uh, you're living what will become history and, and certainly important history if things go right. And uh, very, very exciting, yes. Mm. In the initial stages, which of those games really stood out? The second group game when England beat Mexico 2-0. Bobby Charlton with a fine goal, then France 2-0 in the last group game on the 20th of July. 
confirming that England would top the group and proceed. And then, of course, we come to the knockout stages. Mm. You had the Willy Wonka ticket as well in there, didn't you? The one to the final. So talk us through that day. Who did you go with? I took my mother and my flatmate. We went in his uh, old Morris Thousand, which was decorated with a, a flag of St George. And uh, we took our seats uh, and had a wonderful time. Um, you know, even the thought of being there and the excitement of being there, the thrill of being there, I think um, Marianne Faithful, with or without her fur coat, wouldn't have been more exciting at the time. Do you find yourself reliving those moments a lot now? I mean, are they captured there in in your head as a kind of lovely memory bank to turn to sometimes? Oh, well, I bore people dreadfully because every time we see the... uh, the last moments and the famous Kenneth Walston home line or any any part of the match, I always say, I was there, you know, and people, some people get very bored by it. But, yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful memory. I've been lucky enough to go to some pretty major events of one sort or another. Uh, I've seen Muhammad Ali twice, I, I, although I did buy the tickets for, <laughs> for Muhammad Ali and Henry Cooper and against Brian London as well. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to the 1974 Eurovision Song Contest to see the birth of ABBA. Yeah, I've I've been pretty lucky, I have to say, but this is head and shoulders above all of them. Where were you at Wembley? I mean, how close to the Jeff Hurst goal were you? Looking at the Royal Box, I was sort of halfway along and halfway up. So the ghost goal, the the over-the-line-or-not goal, was to my left. The it's-all-over goal was to my right. Mm. How much of that could you actually see in detail? I mean, with the ghost goal, was there any doubt in your mind as to whether or not it had crossed the line? It was very difficult to tell at the time. Obviously, you're in real time and and, uh, you can't tell. Um, No, it was very difficult at the time. We just wanted it to be a goal. I took a basic 60s cine camera, which I took to the day, Unfortunately, I, I wasn't using it during that moment. I could have made quite a lot of money, I think, if, uh, if I had have been. But no, very exciting. And you just waited for the, the conference between the linesman and the referee. And then they awarded the goal. So wonderful. And um, we didn't really care too much whether it had gone over the line or not. Sure. And in those closing moments, Neil, were you on the pitch? <laughs> no, I wasn't one of those on the pitch. No, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't one of those who thought it was all over. Oh, you can imagine the excitement in the in the crowd. And when it was all over, and Bobby Moore and the team went up to the Royal Box, everybody stood up and obviously looking in that direction. It was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Where did you go after the game? That's interesting, actually. We all went in my friend's Morris Thousand to the Royal Garden Hotel in Kensington, where the team were due to appear on the balcony there. We got in the crowd and waited for them to appear. And I've got some footage, actually, with my old cine camera of that scene. It's shaky and distant and a bit out of focus, but it's all there. It's good stuff, actually. There's Ray Wilson throwing a, a formal issue rose into the crowd. Bobby Moore holding the cup up. And also you can see there's Jimmy Greaves, the luckless Jimmy Greaves and the heroic Jeff Hurst who replaced him either side of the cup, which is quite a poignant frame, actually. So we were all there clapping and on the way to the Royal Garden. It was a magical journey because everybody was tooting their horns. Every single car on the way from Wembley to Kensington. That's one of the most vivid parts of, of my memory of the whole day, actually. Do you ever feel really bad about taking tickets, Not at all. Neil? But there's a Japanese man out there no, who doesn't no, have no, those no, memories. No, 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 Not at all. It was my lucky day. And I don't really think I did anything wrong, to be honest. I think I'd considered most of the options. And, uh, you know, come the day, nobody had come back to collect them. So they were either wasted or they were used. Mm. And I used them. Do you have tickets for this World Cup? I don't, know. I'm afraid I've gone off football in quite a big way, to be honest. Although... Obviously, football at the highest level is worth watching. But uh, no, I don't. I, I will watch it. But uh, Right. What are those reasons? The stuff that happens off the Oh, pitch? the vulgarity of it all, really. In the broadest sense of that word, the obscene wages that um, payers are, are played. All right, it's supply and demand. I understand that. But it's got out of all reasonable proportion. I mean, the John Terry incident is is sort of symptomatic of part of the reason why one becomes disenchanted with the game. It's sad, really. Uh, uh, At many levels, it's still the beautiful game. Neil Coppendale.